birthday, Papa Hicks. Amen. One more, one more turn of the calendar. Amen. Luke chapter 22. We're going we're gonna to stay with where we're at Sunday. We kind of uh, shifted off a little bit, talk a little bit about Easter. We're going to talk about the power of Easter now. And I, if you pay attention, I don't know how far we're going to get tonight with this, but this is going to be kind of like drinking water from a fire hydrant. It's going it's to be a lot of stuff blowed at you, okay? But one of the things I think is very exciting is how the Word of God lines up and really helps us. So tonight I want to talk to you about my high priest. He's our right hand. And to understand that, you look into Luke chapter 22, verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. So where was he at before this? He was in Gethsemane. He had been in the garden. Malchus's ear had been cut off been put back on all these things took place now they're bringing him in before the courts and when they bring him in before the teachers and the high priest they said to him if you are the christ and again christ means the anointed one prophet priest king he's all three of those rolled into one there were a lot of jesus's and a lot of jesus's in the day but there were there was only one christ he was jesus the christ so catch hold these are just little uh, uh tidbits you need to catch hold of they said tell us jesus jesus answered if i tell you you will not believe me and if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated where at? At the right hand of the mighty God. They all ask, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. And, of course, this, was the, this is what sealed the death penalty that he blasphemed, that he considered himself God or the, the Son of God, and they used that as an opportunity to use to crucify him. But before the council, the word our right hand was very important. The Sanhedrin, which was the group, uh, was their council. It was their, their tribal, if you would. They were the, the group of people, the clan, if you, another thought there, that, that gathered together, the judges that made decisions on what would take place with the Jewish people. Uh, there were 70 scribes who had a judge in the middle. A scribe on the left hand, which was somebody who was like a, a preacher, a teacher, and on the right hand was another scribe. The one, the, the one on the left hand uh, disputed, let me get this right. In the middle of the scribe on the left hand and one on the right, disputes brought to them, the judge made a ruling. All sentences and guilty verdicts were read by the scribe on the left hand. Everybody follow this? All the pardons and forgiveness was given by the scribe on the right hand. So when Jesus said to them that I'm going to be at the right hand, he was saying, I'm there giving out pardons. I am the Son of God. In other words, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. So you've got to hear it. God does not love you because Jesus died for you, but Jesus died for you because God loves you. Therefore, God has, he's never angry at us. We've got this, I remember back in, in college, we, we studied a sermon by a man that, uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but it's sinners in the hands of an angry God. And it, when he read this sermon in England, people were falling out of their seat, and they were scared of going to hell and all these other things. And people said, hey, we need to get back to that. The truth of the matter is God has never been angry at us. He's been angry at the curse. The curse took place in the garden. The curse is what separated us from him. So he's been angry at the curse. So when you understand this curse, and, and, and some people are real nervous about this. They think, well, I don't want anybody to put a curse on me. You, you, you get you dealt with any of that Louisiana voodoo and all that stuff. The scripture said voodoo, uh, a curse won't light on you unless somehow you accepted it or you deserved it. So in my life, I've learned to plead the blood of Jesus over me and my family. And you can't curse me. You can't voodoo doll me. You can't do none of that. But this curse had to be broken. So when you started looking at it in Scripture, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, Now Cain said to his brother, the first two boys on earth, the first two brothers, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother, Abel? He said, I don't know. How many know that was rhetorical? He knew where Abel was. I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand so this we begin in the and we start in the beginning of the word of god and we start walking through it why is this important it's going to help you understand why easter was so powerful all the things that went on there and for your own life to understand the blood because again listening to people talk they said why why is blood so important the life is in the blood 
Everything about us is in our blood. Your DNA, when they started discovering your DNA and they started pulling blood, they can tell you what's, what disease is in your body. They can tell you if you get enough, if you got enough red cells, uh, uh, white blood cells, all these things, your blood. If your blood's not moving, so blood is, without it, we don't live. We got to have it. That's why there's really no such thing as the walking dead. No zombies, no blood, no life. Come on, give me an amen. amen. All right. So then God, made, then, then God made man. He placed him in a perfect environment, the garden. Can you imagine what the garden was like with all the fruits and the vegetables and, and just the tremendous, you know, you think you've breathed really good air on a Rocky Mountain high, but imagine what the garden was like and all the, the per- perfection of it. It, 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 was, it was the will of God that when you saw man, you recognized there was a God. And this is it. God creates a perfect something, then a reflection. When you look at the Word of God, He creates something perfect, and then reflects it Himself, and then we reflected Him. So when you saw man, you had to believe there was a God. That's why it's hard for me to ever believe in evolution, because of my fingers, because of my facial, everything about me. Everything about me says this did not come from a blob. It just didn't happen. Okay, so it's important. So when God decided to create the sun, that was something that was true light. The, then he created the moon, which was a reflection of it. So there was a true light, something perfect, and then there was the reflection. Heaven, heaven is the real home of God, the, the throne of God. The earth is for travelers and footstools. How I many know we're traveling here? We're just passing through. We're only visiting this planet. We're not going to be here long. Uh, these earth suits do wear out. So God created himself. Yeah, I mean, God did create, uh, where did God come from? You, get, you can ask that question when you get home. I'm not even going to try that one. I know a lot of people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, where did you come from? Not me. I ain't asking him nothing like that. I'm just going to be glad I'm there. Can I get an amen? amen? That's what I'm going to feel like. So there's God, and then there's man creating his image. So after the sin of separation, in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, Adam and Eve, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Adam's death is when he touched the tree. The scripture says, touch the tree, you'll die. In Hebrew, it says, in dying, thou shalt die. In other words, you're going to keep dying. In the beginning, it was not, didn't seem like the will of God for man to die, that he was going to keep living. But in touching the tree and doing the wrong thing, in dying, you're going to die. In other words, you're going to, you're going to age now. You're going to see the wrinkles. Okay, how much cream you put on it, you're going to get them. Uh, you're, you can stretch it. It don't matter. It's still going to take place. The spiritual death was a separation from God. It was the curse of sin. So the separation took place, and it made us see God as distant, as mean, as, as, as overshadowing. We didn't understand him as love and his intimacy. Very few did in the, New Test- in the Old Testament. David was one that picked up on it. He picked up on the love of God. You see it in David's life, in his love and his heart after God. Satan said in verse 5 in Genesis, Eat and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, the problem was God already told them they were like him. God, God already said, you're created in my image. And then Satan comes along and says, if you eat that, you'll be like God. Duh. We're already like God in, in the ability to create. But now that you say that, ah, that peach or apple or whatever it was does look tempting. So they went for it. They tried it. And the next thing you know, Adam's gone. He's run out of the garden. God yells, Adam, where are you? It was, he was mispositioned. Man's been out of position ever since. The whole issue of getting in the house of God, the whole issue of getting born again, actually is just getting in position. You're sons and daughters, and you're finally getting back into understanding you got a father. That's getting back in position. What happens in life, we get out of whack. We get, we get uh, dis, dis, possessed, if you would. We, we, we lose our possessions. Something happens. In other words, Adam, do you know where you're at? Spiritually, do you understand? So thinking he and Eve could cover their error, man has attempted to cover his own mistakes without God ever since. I mentioned to you Sunday that, that people uh, try to cover themselves by doing good. They try to, to uh, uh, pleasure themselves to the place of, of, of uh, burying the guilt in their lives. All of these things take place. But nothing covers like having a right relationship with God. Just understanding who he is. So God covered them with the skin of an innocent animal. And again, I will say probably a sheep replacing the fig leaves and covered uh, what he discovered. Let me say that again. God covers what he discovers. A lot of times in life, we love to uncover things and talk about what's been uncovered. God has this way of once he's discovered something, he, he covers it. And he covered them with, with the skins of the animal. We often identify blood for the life of 
the flesh is in the blood. We often identify blood with death instead of life. Therefore, God couldn't accept Adam's covering because it had no life in it. Uh, it was the same way with, with Cain. He couldn't accept Cain's because he brought it from the field. That's why Abel's was a better sacrifice. So God covers them and from, from this place. And so we know that Cain killed Abel out of envy and jealousy. So the first victim of sin was not the guilty. Adam was guilty. Eve was guilty. Cain was guilty. The only innocent in the bunch was Abel. So the first one killed out of sin was somebody who was innocent. So God began this principle, blood covering. He even says that his blood's crying out from the ground. And he starts covering to redeem man so that through the ages, God began to reverse the curse. By the way, blood off always costs you something. Anytime you understand sacrifice, sacrifice is real cost. There's a cost to it. Pulling some corn up out of the ground, there's not much cost in that. But for me, giving blood of an animal, giving something I love, there's some cost in that. So God started this, this thing about blood covering. And when he did it, he brought it in before the man Abraham. Genesis 22, 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know the story. Abraham and Isaac head to the top of the mountain. Isaac's the promised son. He finally had Isaac in old age. That's when Sarah laughed when Abraham said, hey, baby, we're going to have a baby. And she laughed and said, no, he ain't. And next thing you know, she does. Y'all don't have to get with me tonight, but it would help. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Then they reached the place. I, we sing this song, Lay Me Down. And, and I often try to mention to Dick, to, trying to explain some of the songs we sing. Because the song is about that. It's about uh, laying yourself down as a sacrifice. Amen. Giving yourself up. Because, again, this young boy Isaac could probably whoop his daddy. You know, I'm going to tell you, once you hit 60, 70, 80 years of age, it's hard to whoop a 19, 20-year-old kid. You know, they're stronger. So he had to give up his will to lay down. He had to lay himself down on the altar. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on your boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld anything from me, not even your only son. And this, I've said this for years. God was looking for somebody who thought like he did, who had a, a father's heart like he did. And when he saw Abraham and he put this test on him, and again, he will never do this again. He will never ask us to sacrifice our children, to give up somebody else uh, in our stead. He'll never do that. It's never happened again. But he knew that in a couple of thousand years, he was going to give up his own son, that he was going to do that. And when he saw Abraham, that's why Abe is known as the friend of God. He's, you know, don't call yourself the friend of God if you're not really ready to be a friend. He pulls back the knife. The hand of God stops him. The angels yell at him. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket, he saw a ram. Who's excited now? Isaac's excited now. Isaac's smiling. He, I, I think he's saying, I knew you'd come through, God. I knew you could do this thing. I knew you would help me out. And they went, he was caught by the horns. In other words, listen to this. The, this. This sheep, this ram, was coming up the side of the mountain on this side, and Abraham and Isaac was coming up on this side. Nobody could see what's on the side of the mountain. And a lot of times in life, you never see the promise of God in your life. You don't see the provision of God in your life. But it's coming up on the other side of the mountain. you just got to stay faithful and do what he calls you to do. And if you're obedient to get to the top and believe God for the best. Watch and see what happens. He looks over. The ram is caught in the thicket. Again, it's a ram. It's a sheep. Amen. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. We use the word a lot. It's one of those easy names to remember. He is God my provider. He got something. There are times in life I have, I have stepped out in faith when we, when we bought churches or built buildings or, or did great, uh, what I consider great things. And I say, Lord, we don't have the money for it. But I believe the ram was coming up on the other side of the mountain. Amen. When we, when we stepped out and done Sunday morning in the second service and we were packed in here you know that in the second service Joseph sat up front with me he said pastor good thing we did this in the tabernacle today we could never get all these people in the sanctuary and there was six seven hundred people out there under the tabernacle a little like muscle car Sunday and I said man you sure got a smart pastor say it say I got a smart pastor you know well, I saw I saw it coming up on the other side of the mountain so we kept the chairs for another week and again, it, it's going to come back down. It always does. But I, my thrill was that so many pastors, I knew their churches were full. It just made me feel good. I'm glad that. And it also told me we got plenty of people around here to fill them. Amen. That need good churches. So there, 
He called the place the Lord will provide, and to this day, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The word Jehovah Jireh, simply the Lord will provide. He did it for us, 110 acres, 5 acres here. Amen. Uh, it's amazing. One who prepares a blessing before I even knew I needed it. Uh, in other words, you got stuff waiting for you that God's prepared for you, and you don't even know you need it yet. Oh, I, I'm talking like, I don't know why a chocolate cake jumped in my head. Uh, just... Maybe the Lord was speaking to you, Sister Linda, about taking care of the preacher there. I don't know. But, but I, I just, I just sent, sent something. That before I even needed it, before I even wanted it, that thing was being prepared. So here at this point, he becomes a lamb for a man. It was only a lamb for a man. Uh, Isaac had been spared. His life had, so it began. And Hebrews 9, 22 says, And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There had to be the shedding. So here we see he becomes in the Passover. When you understand the Passover in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th of the month each day to take the lamb for his family, one for each household. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the, ho of the houses where they eat of the lambs. And that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Listen, you may think to yourself, well, Pastor, that doesn't apply to us. Every time we take communion, it applies to us. This is communion. This is communion. This is the blood on the doorposts on both sides. And he says, when the death angel passes over, your whole family. Everybody say family. family. So it's one thing for me to apply the blood to myself and say, thank you, Lord, for Easter. Thank you that you died for me. Well, what about for my family? What about for, for uh, Mandy and, and for Josiah and Judah and Katie and Jill and all other kids and my, and my grandkids, Cassie and Colton? Now I start applying it. They, they may not be under my roof, but they're still under my influence. So I, I, I'm applying the blood. I'm putting it on the doorpost. I'm believing God for it. That not only is he a, a, a a, a lamb for a man he's a lamb for a family he can take care of a whole family that Passover the they applied that blood there and when I read this that same night they are to eat the meat the the the, the uh, lamb they eat the meat of the lamb roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and it's always reminds me in life and catch this well life is full of Jesus a lot of lamb but it also comes with a little bitter and you can handle bitter in life as long as you're eating a whole lot of lamb if you've got more Jesus in you, that's why I see some people get all jacked up about different things. I said, you know, they just, need more, they just need a bigger Jesus. What I'm saying is bitterness is trying to overcome them. But if you can get a bigger Jesus in your life, you can handle bitter. But you've got to have more Jesus. You've got to get more of that into your life. That's why he said, take it with a little bitter, bitter herbs. And then we find in, Le in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21, he is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat, speaking of the priest, and confess it, uh, confess it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and all their sins and put them on the goat's head. So here we find that not only was the, the, the blood for a, a man, for the family, but now we're going to find it for a nation. They started doing it for a whole nation. And now, not only were they sacrificing lambs, they sacrificed goats and pigeons. If you were poor, it was a pigeon. If you had some money, you walked in with a lamb, they said, oh, look at you, rich guy, you know, coming in with a lamb. And you come in holding a little, little bird in your hand, they know it bless his heart. You know, he ain't got much. But, but that's all he had to sacrifice. So here we see on the Day of Atonement, which means at one month, atonement, at one month, that's when we become one because of the blood the high priest sacrificed a lamb, takes the blood and applied it to the goat. The goat went out as a, a uh, I'm trying to think of the word, S thank you, scapegoat. Went out as a scapegoat. So he became a lamb for a man, a lamb for a family, a lamb for a nation. And then we get to the New Testament. You know, what about us? And we see where John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the and this really blessed me. Not only is he for a man, not only is he for a family, not only is he a lamb for a nation, but now he's a lamb that takes away the sin of the whole world, that he's got us. That that's, to me is an amazing. So what happens here is, is God is starting, let's go back, to reverse the curse. He's starting to turn this thing back around. Because remember, the curse separated him. So whole Jesus dying on the cross ooh, was about us, but it was also about the Father. It was a way of bridging the gap to get us back to Dad again. That's what the cross was all about. So he begins to reverse it. How do you do it? Watch this. Adam lost it in the garden. Jesus got it back in the garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. The blood poured through his pores. Here we go. We got the blood. Adam lost blessing and was covered with a fig leaf. When Jesus walked by, and this always got me, he cursed a fig tree. 
He looked at that fig tree, walked by it, and I, I, I see him look at that fig tree and go, I remember what you tried to do. I mean, he's talking to a, a tree. So don't, don't get too far away from that for just a moment. But he looks at the tree, and he cursed it. And when he did, no more figs, no more leaves. He remembered in the garden, you tried to cover it. But this tree here is not going to do it. The tree I'll be on will do it. On the Passover, amen, at, the, at one month, the priest had a lamb in the temple. God's lamb was in the courtroom. High priest would check the lamb for blemishes. What did they say in Luke chapter 23, verse 14? Herod said, we find no fault in him. They would look at the lamb, and they'd go through the whole skin, and they'd say, well, there's no blemishes here. We can sacrifice this lamb. Herod looked at Jesus, the lamb of God, and he said, I don't see no fault in him. All this is going on to reverse this curse. Adam was naked and ashamed, ran from the garden. Jesus was stripped naked and unashamed on the cross. He stood there on the cross with no shame. From Adam's side, Eve came. From Jesus' side, we came. We're the church, covered by the blood. Amen. Purchased by that. Therefore, Paul pro proclaimed, and I close with this, I am crucified with Christ. Man, when you get to a place in your life where you understand Easter, where you understand the cross and the blood, that he was a lamb for a man, a family, a nation, the world, that he stands for you, he's Jehovah Jireh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm still living. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In other words, what I'm being able to do is because anything good in me, people ask, me, what do you know good, Pastor? Only one. The rest of us need a lot of help. Amen. We all need a lot of help. It lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. The curse began to reverse. Matthew 27, verse 50, when Jesus had cried out again, it is finished in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. In other words, let me go back. The cross, what about me and you just getting saved? It was about God positioning himself as our father again, that we'd been mispositioned. And so this curtain, and I read it again this week in a history book, not out of a Bible, but out of a history book that talked about that curtain being 60 foot uh, uh, wide and it was uh, 20 foot high in the, in the width of a man's hand it's how thick the curtain the material was and God ripped it from top to bottom not from bottom to top because that would look like somebody come in there and try to cut it but he ripped it from top to bottom and it wasn't to let us in it was to let him out so he could come and hang out with us my friend this is the victory of Easter when Jesus died that thing if you had been in that temple Oh, if somebody could have just had an iPhone video in that moment when that curtain split. And the priest, they're still sacrificing the animals. And the blindness of the priest, they sewed the curtain back up. You know why? Because we love our rituals. It keeps people in bondage. Amen. We want them, we, we still the big eye. If we forgot that God had come out then. And then we hit the day of Pentecost, and then it was home. Now we receive the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. Jesus was the mediator, not the separator, between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Therefore, there's one God and one mediator, our high priest. One mediator. Where, where does he sit? At the right hand. What's he doing? Giving out pardons. Forgiving. He's not, he's not just washing over stuff. He wants us to do right, but he's, he's forgiven us, washes over us. Between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in his proper time. Stand with me. This is a lot of stuff you got hold of tonight. Amen. This is one of them. Sometimes I, I, I take one of these and hold it back for a Sunday morning for a bigger crowd, and I refuse the temptation. I said, Lord, let whoever shows up here tonight be blessed with this. Because to me, this is one of my favorite words. When I understand what he became for us and how he became it. But when I look at this, I, I can see it. He, he, he gave a ransom. A ransom means I stepped in for you. It, it should have been you, but I stepped in for you so you could be free. That's amazing. This is what we have to do. We've got to trust God. We've got to trust him in all the things that we do. And we got to look at this book a little bit closer and realize something. He's my high priest. He's my right hand. All through Scripture, it speaks of the right hand. The right hand is fellowship. It's ministry. It's power. 
the right hand is healing. The right hand. He's our right hand. He's at the, so when he told the Sanhedrin, I'm at the right hand of God Almighty. Oh, man, he lit a fire in them. That moment, they realized, we're talking to somebody special. And all through his trial, all the way up to the cross. And we'll, we're going to walk on into that a little bit more on the weekend. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for those watching online. I ask God your blessing upon us. And we realize, you are our high priest. I don't have to go to anyone but you and ask you for forgiveness ask for direction, ask you for strength and power, ask you for the ability to press on into my next day and days. So God, my high priest, Jesus, my right hand, the one that sets in the right hand, I, I, I plead with you, I ask you, strengthen this body. Give us the ability to be, be good men and women, to love those that are around us, to encourage and not criticize, to lift up and not tear down. God, I thank you that we have belief and not doubt. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Make sure you greet my friend CJ before you leave.